Hello and welcome to C++ Weekly. I'm your host, Jason Turner. I am available for contracting, code reviews, and on-site training. In this episode, I am going to discuss using a Lippincott function. Now, this is not something that I came up with by any means. This was popularized by Lisa Lippincott, and the name Lippincott function was actually given to it by John Kolb. And I first read about it on Nicholas's CPP Secrets blog, where he discusses using a Lippincott function for centralized exception handling. And the basic concept is that if you've got many different functions that need to have the same sort of exception handling, then you can use a Lippincott function to handle those exceptions and do the same thing with them in one centralized location. That's, well, kind of redundant. But I'll show you what I mean with a little bit of examples. So we are, of course, going to use the Compiler Explorer as we often do in this show. And I'm going to start with a quick example and then show how we might use a libidconf function. So say we've got a couple of different functions that we want to write. And they each have some operation that they might perform. And we don't know exactly what's going to happen when do thing is called. It might throw an exception. And now this example is going to look slightly contrived, but uh, bear with me here and I think we'll get to an interesting place. So we've got two different functions that call two other different functions. And we need to catch to see if they've got some sort of exception that is handled here. So we've got our func, and it calls this other function called do thing, and it may have thrown a runtime error, so we need to do something with that. And it may have thrown just a base class exception, and if it does, then we need to do something with that. And so we've gotten this code now that does several different things, and it's possible that it might throw some unknown exception. And we've got this generated code here. We've got 57 operations. It's difficult to call this instructions because many of them are function calls and things that are happening here in labels. But we need to have similar catches around our other function here called func2. And it is calling the other function do thing2. And we can see here that we've got like 95 instructions that have been generated by the compiler because we've got a duplication of all of the different operations that might occur. So the idea of a Lippincott function is that we're going to create a new function that rethrows the last unhandled exception and then actually tries to catch one of these different things. So we can use this function to handle one of the errors that may have occurred. And now we can adjust our body of our function to simply call the Lippincott function. And then we can, in a do not repeat yourself kind of way, really simplify the bodies of our functions. So this is a bit smaller. We're down to 83 functions or 83 instructions that it might execute. There we go. And we've got two different bodies of things that we're executing, and we've got this ability to not repeat ourselves, like I said a moment ago, and we're able to centralize this stuff. So if an exception is thrown, any exception, then we call our Lippincott function. And then on line 11 here, we rethrow that exception, and then we have the body here that can catch each of the possible options, do the right thing, and then continue on. Now, this is largely advertised as a way of handling things like if you have a C API that's C++ underneath and you don't want any exceptions to escape, then this can be a standardized way of doing that. But it got me thinking about template programming. And what's the possibility of having a bunch of duplicated generated code 
from the template stuff that you've been doing. So I took a look at that real quick and came up with an example like this. So I have this, again, slightly contrived, but the entire point is to generate some examples that do something that might happen in the real world with a templated class. So we've got our templated class with this do thing function, and it calls some other function that's templated. And I did this so that I could give something that's extern. We could give something that compiles in the Compiler Explorer but is not fully inlined, so the compiler doesn't know everything that's happening here, and we're able to demonstrate what might happen. So I've generated six different types here using standard integral constant just to generate a new type, and I'm passing those in to our template for our struct s, and then I am calling our function, and our function is a templated function that we don't have a definition for, but we can see that we've got six different things being called here, and we've got our apparently quite benign exception handling code inside our do thing member function. And we can see that the compiler has had to generate 320 instructions here. Now if we were to apply this concept of a Lippincott function here, then we might have something that looks like this. And again, we just simply want to rethrow the last thing that was thrown. And we want to simplify the body of this. And now we're taking advantage of our Lippincott function. And it is generating now only 153 instructions. So it's like half the size that it used to be. Now granted, this means that our exception handling is not in line, but this could be a significant savings in compile time, compile size, and runtime by not uh, overloading our instruction cache with a bunch of extra stuff that doesn't need to be there if you're using exceptions properly and you're not using them for regular control flow handling, but they are truly exceptional cases. So this is something to think about to reduce the amount of duplicated code in your template types when you have exception handling that you need it to do. Be sure to subscribe, follow me on Twitter, and check out any of the links below.